You know, people often ask me why I'm so passionate about working on uh, children's nutrition, on battling childhood obesity, and, and its next door neighbor, which of course is hunger. Um, I don't have a kid, so it's not obvious to people, but I do make my living through food, so I think the way I get back to my community should also be through food. And I think as a citizen, uh, the only way to attack hunger, childhood obesity, and the healthcare costs of the future is to attack the general nutrition of our children. I think that the, the only um, smart choice is to invest a little bit of money now in better nutrition for our kids to control healthcare costs of the future, to eradicate hunger, and to lower those obesity rates. You know, you don't have to have millions of dollars or a television show to make a difference. Any mom, dad, or kid can walk into the school and say, I care, I want to be involved. Everybody can do something. All you have to do is literally ask. Please welcome to the stage youth health advocate Haley Thomas. Hello, everyone. What an awesome event so far. Great panel. All right. In 2008, when I was seven years old, my dad was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. Now, this condition has affected his and my mom's side of the family, but this news was still a shock to our family. My dad is a very active person, and at the time, he played soccer several times per week, went to the gym, and we thought we ate pretty well. Today, I am 13 years old, my dad's diabetes has been completely reversed, and I've been on a mission to maintain a healthy lifestyle and inspire my peers to do the same. <laughs> my journey between 2008 and today is paved with amazing opportunities, mentors, teachers, adult and youth partners, and family support that sustains my efforts. And I am so excited to be here today to share a bit about that journey with you all today. Now, to start, I'd like to say that having access to healthy foods and beverages, proper nutrition education, and physical activity has helped cure my dad. And making sure that kids in my community have that same access has become the main focus of my advocacy, which actually began when I was selected to the Alliance for a Healthier Generations Youth Advisory Board. And from the Alliance, I've learned about all of the issues that can lead to childhood obesity, malnutrition, and hunger. And I was also encouraged to join the movement to inspire and motivate my peers to embrace healthy habits. I help in my community and across the country by speaking at events like this. And in my community, I work through my HAPPY organization. Now, HAPPY is an acronym, and it stands for Healthy, Active, Positive, Purposeful Youth. <laughs> and the program is partnered with YWCA in Tucson, Arizona, where I live. And through that, we offer kids healthy cooking classes, proper nutrition education, fun physical activities, and of course, opportunities to build leadership skills. I also host and support local community events and even bring cooking classes into schools. And let me tell you, it has been an amazing experience. I've had the honor of working with hundreds of kids, and from that, I've learned that when kids are given the proper information, tools, and resources, they will make healthy choices and inspire their friends and family to do the same. So naturally, it's very important that when kids are inspired to make those healthy choices, that they have access to what they need. So I'd like to thank those of you in the audience who work to make sure that kids everywhere have access to healthy foods and beverages. And I'd also like to say that me, my peers, and our families appreciates everyone who works to bring fresh fruits and vegetables into food deserts and to fund organizations like mine that offer health and wellness programs. Our schools appreciate salad bars, gardens, and PE. And those in underserved communities appreciates advocates like all of you who work to bring what they need to where they live and to make it easy and affordable to make those healthy choices. So, <laughs> 
So if you are someone yet to join the movement, I of course would ask you to do that. And of course consider joining and partnering with any number of the amazing youth advocates within the Alliance for a Healthier Generation or other organizations across the country. Because young people can be awesome partners. We are ready and able to help ensure that we have a healthy lifestyle. And finally, to quote a few of the Clinton Foundation's guiding principles, we are all in this together, and the greatest good is helping people live their best life story. Thank you. Please welcome to the stage nutrition expert, The Today Show, NBC News, Joy Bauer. Executive Director, Center for Science in the Public Interest, Dr. Michael Jacobson. Senior Vice President, Boys and Girls Clubs of America, Kevin McCartney. President and CEO, American Beverage Association, Susan Neely. Actor and President, Sterling Farms, Wendell Pierce. Senior Program Officer, and Director of Policy, Health Foundation of South Florida, Dr. Janice Rosaria Shop, and Commission Chair, Vitality Institute and Managing Partner, Physic Ventures, Will Rosenzweig. Hi, um, thank you so much for all being here. It's, it's always so invigorating for me to be in a room with so many people who share a passion for health. Um, and I mean that with you guys, I mean everybody up here with me, these iconic health advocates, and so many people who are live streaming right now. We are trending officially. That's pretty cool. <laughs> As I was listening to Haley speak, I couldn't help think, my gosh, she's in seventh grade. She is so sharp, she's so articulate, she's so insightful, and thank goodness I am only moderating this panel and not following her with a keynote speech. That would have been awful. <laughs> so this is my first time moderating, and um, I was so appreciative and honored to be asked to come here, and then to find out that I was specifically um, moderating this panel discussion. And the reason is because I have a whole history that um, jumped through these challenges. And most people know me as the food lady on NBC, but I think I want to step back and tell you a little bit about my past before I start firing out the hard questions uh, so that you fully understand how much this discussion and conversation means to me. In the beginning of my career, I was in clinical nutrition. I was the director of nutrition and fitness for pediatric cardiology at a Mount Sinai Medical Center. And I was this you know, little, eager, totally green, um, wide-eyed girl. And I wrote a grant called the, for the Heart Smart Kids program to get funding so that I could go into the areas that were at high risk for heart disease and I could educate young kids, kindergarten all the way up through 12th grade, and help them learn about better food choices and getting more physical activity. And I landed the grant. It was a small grant, but it paid my salary. So I was the program. And I went into East Harlem. We adopted one high school. It was PS 146 on 106 and 1st Avenue, and I went in there and I, I taught nutrition lessons to all of these different grades, and then at designated times throughout the week, we would clear the lunchroom, and we would push all of the tables that were on little rolly wheels, and I would hold aerobic classes, and I had a big ghetto box, remember those things before little iPads came about? Yeah. And um, you know, I, they would be dancing, they would wear their leg warmers and bands, little groovy bands on their foreheads. And it was really interesting because the parents, a lot of them didn't even speak English, they spoke Spanish, and I didn't speak Spanish, and I only taught in English. And they would still come and they would sit outside the classrooms. And I had health committees, and I gave cooking instructions, and I even did walking competitions. And with the walking competitions, I recruited all sorts of high schools throughout the area. So we got into regular Harlem as well, mid-Harlem. And the reason I'm telling you this story is because the kids, the parents, the faculty, they were like sponges. They sopped up all of this great information. And you know, they had amazing intentions. And then you talk about the follow through. They didn't have access to any of the healthy food that I was talking about. It was daunting. It was disconcerting. It was maddening. It really was maddening. So now fast forward. 
we're not just talking about the fact that it's a problem, we're talking about solutions, and that gets me really excited. Uh, my heart is also racing because I can't believe that I'm up here with, like I said earlier, these, these are iconic health advocates. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna let each of you all take about five minutes or so and tell us about yourself and your organizations, and if you can answer this question. It's so funny, I drafted so many questions that I wanna ask that I'd have to be here you know, eight hours straight, and I promise I'm gonna let you all ask your questions, and we're gonna answer some questions that are coming in from Twitter. But I do wanna start with this question. What, and we're gonna start with Michael Jacobson, who by the way, is literally a rock star in the RD world. That's for registered dietitians. He has a Nutrition Action newsletter, Nobody who's an RD ever misses reading from cover to cover. You cover all the hard things. You do exposés on companies. You make them transparent, whether it's in a negative or a kudos sort of light. And everything that you do is evidence-based science, so thank you. He's our Bon Jovi. <laughs> so with that, <laughs> Michael, what investments or commitments does your work or your organization do to help close the inequities around access to healthy foods and beverages for all youth, no matter where they live and no matter what their zip code? And what has resulted from the good work that you're doing? <laughs> Just a well, small question. <laughs> yeah, a small question. Uh, is this my five minutes? <laughs> yes. Okay. I yes. <laughs> thought maybe it was a bonus couple of things. Well, <laughs> thank you so much. Joy, for those uh, very, very kind words. Um, my organization, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is a consumer advocacy group in Washington, D.C. And we do a lot of education, especially through Nutrition Action. Uh, uh, if you don't read the newsletter, you should. And also getting in the media, writing books, that sort of stuff. Uh, and we also do more pointed advocacy. So we led the efforts to get the nutrition facts label on food packages, to get a definition for organic food, to improve school lunches and breakfasts. Um, we're trying to get, uh, reduce, get trans fat out of the food supply, and that's 75% gone. And we're also working on sodium, trying to reduce sodium levels in the food supply through regulation, admonition, uh, um, bully pulpit, uh, trying to get the government involved in these activities. Um, and in some cases, I think we've really had a big effect, like with trans fat, it's kind of one of the most obvious things. Um, food, the nutrition facts label is invaluable to tens of millions of people who are watching their cholesterol and watching their sodium levels. Um, but clearly, we have to do more in terms of obesity, heart disease, diabetes, all, uh, all these diet-related chronic diseases. Um, and I'm, I'm glad you introduced me as in terms of asking me, what can you do for the whole, what are you doing for the whole country? Because most of our activities do focus on the general population. And I was thinking closing the gap is not a very ambitious goal, that um, white kids are not exactly winning the uh, world's svelte competition. So we've got to work on, on the entire country. And access to healthy foods is also, it's extremely valuable. If it ain't there, you can't eat it. But if it is there, like plunk down a new supermarket in the middle of Newark, there's also going to be a lot of junk food along with those fruits and vegetables. Junk foods become more, valuable, more uh, available as well. So uh, we've got to do more than making the food available. And I'd like to mention just a couple of things, some kind of saw, relatively soft on the education front, and then some tougher things that I think uh, our society needs to take on. Cooking is becoming a lost art. Today's parents grew up in McDonald's. They don't know how to cook. They can't teach their kids how to cook. So we've got a couple of generations who are really dependent on the food industry, on packaged foods and restaurant foods for their diets. And you're stuck then with whatever those out operations are gonna serve. So I think we need to get food education into schools, all schools. It should be gardening, cooking, and nutrition. And it's expensive. So it'd be a real investment for our society. But without being able to cook, 
uh, you're not going to have a healthy diet. You just face it. And every kid should graduate high school knowing how to cook 10 or 20 healthy foods that they find delicious. And that will give them the self-confidence to keep going throughout their lives. So that's the positive thing. I think we, another positive thing is we need to have major community-wide education campaigns encouraging people to eat healthier foods, fruits and vegetables. These kinds of campaigns, I'm sure, could be successful. And we're beginning to see the produce industry stepping up to the plate. But I think CDC really has to step up also. And the flip side of that is get the junk food advertising off of television, out of kids' eyes. Get the cartoon characters off of the junky foods. It's doable, but so far the food industry has fought off even voluntary guidelines. Even the voluntary guidelines are too tough. So, so that's on the education front. Now the other thing is dealing with, I think, and I'm sorry to say, Susan, uh, but I will name some of your products. Soda pop, soft drinks, sugar drinks, liquid candy, call it what you want, is a major contributor to obesity. It helped fuel the obesity epidemic from 1980 to 2005 or so. We've got to cut consumption, especially in kids. And I'm not saying you can never have a soda. It's not a poison, but it's something we have to be drinking a lot less of. The big solution that we've proposed is to get the Food and Drug Administration to enforce the law. The law says you can't have ingredients in the food supply at unhealthy levels. Well, the Dietary Guidelines for Americans says that sugar, high fructose corn syrup, are in the food supply at unhealthy levels. We suggested to the FDA that it limit the sugar content in beverages to about one-fourth of their current levels and replace them with nothing or with natural sweeteners or approved artificial sweeteners, but get rid of the sugar and make these products innocuous, make them safe for the public's health. The FDA, I must say, has not leaped at the opportunity to act on the petition, but um, thanks to people like Sam, I'm sure that we'll see some progress in the future. The, uh, short of that, we can tax soda, and some cities and states have tried doing it. We need bolder attempts. We need to beat back the industry's opposition, and sooner or later, soda will be taxed. Taxing soda, a penny an ounce, say, 12 cents a can, could raise about $10 billion a year that could pay for those cooking classes and all kinds of other things to promote health, community education campaigns. A simple measure is to put warning labels on soda. That's not going to totally change America's drinking habits, but it will help reposition soda in the public's mind. And then we need to test, and this is the one thing that really is aimed at low-income folks, uh, the SNAP program pays for about $4 billion worth of soda pop every year, about $4 billion worth of, of this worthless product. We, we, need, we need to have some tests to see if not allowing SNAP to be used for soda would affect soda consumption in that population. And some brave uh, city or state needs to step up and talk to the Department of Ag Agriculture about the opportunity to do that. So, um, you know, so that, sorry, Susan, for putting you a little in the spotlight there and on the defensive. And the last thing I should say is, really, we need to uh, broaden the lens, do the wide angle. For obesity, we've and heart disease and diabetes and all these other health problems that disproportionately affect low-income minority folks, we need to look much broader. We need good jobs. We need better schools. We need a cleaner environment, safer neighborhoods, because it's all that, that whole social environment contributes to health problems in a major way. Um, and that is a huge investment of uh, uh, political capital, our, our um, efforts on the part of the public. But I think in the end, 
to really solve these problems, that's where we're going to have to go. So, thank, thank you, you so much. And I love that you brought up the cooking, because I'll tell you, in my experience, um, in these very same communities, the cooking classes were wildly popular. The issue was that in order to get fresh fruits and vegetables and whole grains into the cooking mix for these particular recipes, they couldn't find them after we were through with the classes and they would go to make them in their homes. So I would love to come up with some sort of solution for that. I think that you know, having the kids involved, inviting the parents in, doing all sorts of cooking classes is a huge, huge positive jump start. Thank you. Well, I think we could get it if we just put Haley on it for a couple so of weeks. I think so too, I know. <laughs> Happy Haley. <laughs> Kevin. Hi, Joy. Hey, Kevin. How are you doing? I'm great. Tell us about yourself. Okay. Well, first of all, now I know why you put me between Michael and Susan. <laughs> I don't think one totally person was enough. That's all good. It's okay. I'm not afraid. No, I know I'm you're not. not. I know you're not. Susan, you're, you're great. Thank you. Um, so, yes, uh, Boys and Girls Clubs. I, um, uh, I head up the Government Relations Office for Boys and Girls Clubs of America, uh, now in Washington, D.C., and that's after a long career of actually running Boys and Girls Clubs out in California. And... Um, before I go on, I wanted to recognize our National Youth of the Year. I think she's, yeah, there she is. You're going to hear from her later on. But Kiana Nolan, could you please stand up? There she is, Kiana Nolan. This is, <laughs> Kiana is uh, our National Youth of the Year. She just finished her freshman year in Howard, at Howard University. Uh, go, Howard. And uh, we have the pleasure, Heather Dumont and I have the pleasure of working with, with Kiana. Matter of fact, Kiana is going to intern at Minority Whip uh, Stindy Hoyer's office this summer, so we're all very excited about that. It's our first uh, internship program, and Kiana is our first ever. We also have some local boys and girls clubs here. Uh, and uh, I don't know all you guys who are here. I know Scotty Robinson's here, but if you guys could just stand up uh, and be recognized, please, real quickly. I know you're here. Don't be shy. You guys aren't shy. Come on. There you are. We got some clubs here. There's Paul in the back. And the, and the reason I, I want to recognize these guys, Joy, is because uh, I mentioned I worked at Boys and Girls Clubs for a number of years, and now I'm in the government relations office. And so I'm a little, little disconnected from what's going on on the ground. Uh, we work on the policy side and the advocacy side to make sure that we're doing the right things for our kids. And so we obviously work very closely with our clubs. Uh, to make sure in this particular instance that we're trying to make as much healthy food available for our kids. We have 4,000 sites across the country and we serve about 4 million kids. And somebody uh, earlier, I think it may have been Sam, mentioned the zip codes. You know, we're in the zip codes where we need to be. In other words, we are where kids don't have access to healthy food, where they don't have access to any food. You know, last year we served 25 million meals 25 million meals and 48 million snacks, and that's good, but our goal by 2018 is to serve 150 million meals and 285 million snacks. That's a huge step, and the only way we're going to do that is get to work, you know, everybody here in this room, the researchers, the policy um, makers, the, certainly the foundations, certainly the federal government, the state government, the county government, because this thing is just way too important. You, you know, you, and we've heard all the stats, you know, three in 10 kids are overweight or obese this year. In 1960, that was 4%. I mean, what's going on? We know what's going on. They're eating bad food. They don't have access to healthy food. Uh, and so we're trying to do what we can to change that. I mentioned policy. We're working real closely with Senator Pryor, who chairs the um, Ag Appropriations Committee. Senator Pryor has been great. So what we're trying to do is make it, do some policy changes, so we should talk, do some policy changes uh, within the appropriations bill that makes it easier for not only schools, but nonprofit organizations to access these foods, to make sure that we're, uh, for example, I mentioned the snacks, a little wonkish right now, 84 cent reimbursement USDA snack, we're trying to get that increase to a dollar. The reason we're trying to get that increase for the dollar, obviously the money, but if you can buy snacks at a higher rate, you're going to be able to buy healthier snacks. Same thing with our, our uh, third meal. We're trying to get third meal reimbursement that currently isn't possible in the USDA. So we're trying to get that done. So things like that, transportation. Transportation, uh, I was talking to somebody earlier about rural, uh, a minute left, about rural clubs uh, and rural sites um, and the fact that we can't 
serve the food because there's no provider. So if we can get the kids to a club, get the kids to a Y, get the kids to a Parks and Rec, somewhere in town. So those are some of the things that, that we're working on. I uh, mentioned the goal, Senator Pryor, USDA. I gotta say this, so USDA has a goal of 10, serving an additional 10 million summer food meals this summer. And so they've come to Boys and Girls Clubs as well as a bunch of other providers say, how can you guys help? We're, honestly, we're kind of tapped out. I mean, we're doing all that we can, but there's one possibility. And this is, this is, I think, what this thing is all about, is trying to come up with new ways, innovative ways to solve problems. Uh, 10 million meals. So for those of you who are in California, from California, there's a program called ACES. It's the old Prop 49 program. ACES is an after-school program. It's a great program. We have 350 sites funded by that after-school program. The problem is it closes in the summer. So I went to USDA and I said, look, let's figure this out. If we can reopen these sites in the summer, we can now serve a couple of hundred kids a day. We did the math. And so just Boys and Girls Club, I said, look, we'll do a pilot. We'll do a pilot. We'll do 20 sites. We're going to serve 200,000 additional meals. We just got to reopen. It's about $50,000 a site. If we were, just in California, if we were to open 70 sites, and we have 350 Boys and Girls Club, there's 4,000 of these across the state. If we were to open up 70 sites, and it's going to cost around $3.5, $4 million for those 70 sites, we could serve all 10 million meals. We could serve all 10 million meals in one state. And the reason I say that is that's what this is about. We got to think differently. We just can't do it the same. This is too important. So I'm out of time. <laughs> Thanks, Joy. Thank you. And I think we all agree with you. So Susan, now it is your turn. Well, thank you very much, Joy, and thank you to uh, Clinton Health Matters for inviting me and, and more specifically inviting a representative from industry to participate. Um, I've told the challenge today to all of us is to think outside the box on how to continue to make the progress that Dr. Lavisa Mori cited this morning in closing the gap in childhood obesity. And I would submit to you that thinking outside the box is to bring industry to the table. Because when we are there and we're inside the room and helping figure out how to solve the problem, we can really make a difference. We believe, I'm speaking on behalf of the beverage industry that I work with and represent, we believe that childhood obesity is a real crisis in this country and we need to be doing something about it. We have, as you know, incredible scope and stature and size. We can, when we commit and get involved, we can make things happen. And we can get further faster if you have us there working with you than working against us. So far from feeling defensive, Michael, I feel very proud and positive and strong about the things that we as an industry have contributed to as part of larger efforts. I will give you two examples. One is the agreement that we signed actually eight years ago today, or not today, but this month with the Alliance for a Healthier Generation. We agreed that we would change the mix of the beverages that we uh, were selling in schools. And the goal was to take calories out of those beverages. Thanks to a lot of the innovation that the industry had done and continues to do, there are a lot of choices of beverages that have fewer calories. There are smaller portion sizes of the beverages with calories. I know you all have seen those small little cans of uh, soft drinks that are increasingly popular, just uh, those among others. And we said that's what we'll put in schools, and it's going to take us three uh, school years to do it because there's lots of other players involved and contracts and bottlers and school officials, but we'll do it. Three years pass, we do it, and guess what the result was? 90% fewer calories from beverages shipped to schools. 90% fewer calories. So we feel pretty good about that. Now let's continue the story on because it, interestingly, it's been talked about a lot but more broadly. We need a national standard. We need a national standard about the, the foods related to the foods that are sold in schools. 
About this time, the uh, President Obama hasn't been elected. It's time to reauthorize the Child Nutrition Act. Congress, the Obama administration, Sam and others begin talking about, is there a standard that can be in there that relates to the food and beverages sold in schools? Well, we said, gosh, we've actually implemented what we think is a de facto national standard. We've done it on a voluntary basis, but we think it's a good one. It's producing results. And, you know, we always say in Washington, the best coalitions, the stranger the bedfellows, the stronger the coalition. We actually work closely with Margot Wu-Tan, Michael's colleague, to advance the legislation that included this provision that the Secretary of Agriculture would establish a standard for what's sold in schools. So we were in the room helping make this happen. As Sam said earlier, the law will now go into effect. And the standard is very similar to what we had already done. Again, we think it's a good standard. But my point is that we completed our work on a voluntary basis in the 2009-2010 school year. We'll now have a national standard that's broader than beverages, but includes beverages, um, beginning the school year of 2014. So you've let us in, we make a commitment, we deliver, and I think a lot happened. We also were very proud to support the launch of Mrs. Obama's Let's Move In uh, initiative and, and agreed that we would put the calorie label on the front of every bottle, can, and package because we know from, we, we do talk to consumers a lot, so that's part of the knowledge we bring, what motivates them, what do they want, that that calorie information is very desirable. And a lot in the public health community have talked about front of pack labeling, but we actually went ahead and did it. That, uh, effort was completed uh, two years ago in 2012. I don't think there is a federal um, rule yet. There probably will be. But meantime, consumers have the benefit of that calorie information. So whether it's your tea, your sports drink, your soft drink, you know the calories that are in that container, and you can make an informed decision. So two examples. Again, I could go on, but we're very proud of those. So as you're thinking about engaging industry, as would maybe a novel thought to some in the room, not others who've already um, done that and I think have the, the bragging rights to show that it works, here's how we think. We want to be part of a credible effort. We want to be part of a comprehensive effort that's not saying, oh, you're all the problem, but rather is saying, you know, can you do your part? What can you industry do to contribute to this solution? And we want to be engaged. So we know we're only as good as what we've done lately. We're actively thinking and talking about how can we be in the zip codes where there are those disparities? How can we partner with the Boys and Girls Clubs and WISE and local and state elected officials and federal to continue to make a difference, continue to do our part to close the gap in childhood obesity? We'll be there. Just ask us. We're ready to partner. We have a proven track record in that regard, and we're, we're darn good when you get us involved. So. Thank you very much again for including us and allowing us to participate. Thank you. Well, Susan, thank you so much for that. You are in a tough position, and you're a huge asset to the health community. So thank you for being here and for everything that you've done. And those are two tremendous examples. Wendell. OK. Um, first of all, I lost my glasses. I am not the. Uh, self-indulgent actor from Hollywood wearing sunshades. Uh, these are the only prescription glasses that I have. Uh, so please forgive me. Um, as I look around the room, and especially on this panel, uh, I thought of the Sesame Street song, one of these things is not like the other. Yes, that's me. Um, what is Wendell Pierce, this actor of 30 years, uh, doing uh, in this forum, even invited to this forum. Um, and then uh, I heard uh, Hallie speak, and I said, oh, okay, that's why I'm here. That's why we're all here. It's because of the children. And uh, I became a, a involved in this by chance, but then realized that I would uh, take the personal initiative to be, to stay in this advocacy world of changing childhood obesity, because the one thing I knew that I could contribute was I am that cautionary tale. The, the, the child who was obese and now the adult who struggles with obesity. So I said I'll be brave enough to actually put my inadequacies on the platform 
to also remind myself and everyone what we're working towards and what we're trying to change, because that's my personal journey. Uh, I'm from New Orleans, Louisiana, and uh, was devastated nine years ago when my neighborhood was in some of the deepest part of the flooding of Katrina. And we put together our own resident-initiated um, uh, resident uh, 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 rebuilding program to bring people back. And it was, it's, it's going well. It's Punch and Train Park. Look it up. And we started to realize, though, that our commercial districts weren't coming back, that grocery stores weren't coming back. And I started to realize that in New Orleans, we had an issue with food deserts even prior to the storm. In the Lower Ninth Ward District of New Orleans, they haven't had a decent grocery store there in 20 to 30 years. And that's when I realized something needed to be done. Uh, I, I started to realize that American industry was standing on the sideline, that not only I could become an advocate, but actually uh, step up to the plate uh, as a businessman that while other, uh, that while as companies we can look at China and India and see emerging markets, but yet we look at our own cities, our own inner cities, our own underserved communities, and we don't see the demand that's there, the need that is there, and see the emerging market that is there. Citizenry that takes the time to get on a bus to travel a half an hour to your stores, to buy your products, and all they've asked in return is that you bring a facility or a grocery store to their neighborhood and all of those industries stay on the sideline. That's when I discovered I'm not a policy advocate. I'm not a, 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 um, I was never in the policy world. I'm an actor. And I realized that uh, I started to learn. In a short learning curve, I learned that uh, about food deserts, and about the designation of food deserts. And then the first ladies put a challenge to the businesses and said, step off the sideline, go into those underserved communities in 2011, and I heeded that call, and I appreciate what Mrs. Obama did. Uh, also, I learned about HFFI, the Healthy Fresh Food Initiative, and said, let's take advantage of that. Let's, it is there to incentivize businesses to come into these communities. Well, it incentivized us, and we put together the Sterling Farms Grocery Store. I'm a small grocery chain owner. Well, we go into food deserts. And I remember one day where I had a meeting with Mr. Cass, and I just want to thank you publicly for all the help, guidance, and um, uh, support of the mission that you've given me as a small business owner, creating jobs and actually meeting a need, trying to change, um, trying to change and affect people's lives for good. Now, someone asked me backstage, Janice, I think, asked me, well, are you making a difference? And I said, you know something? I don't know. I know one thing, though. Let's give people a choice first. We know that people will eat what they have access to. Am I making a difference by bringing fresh produce and fresh fruit and vegetables? I don't know yet. But I know that I'm giving people who were in a food desert before an opportunity to actually change their lives and actually make the choice. One time I was shooting a, a, a promotional video or a, a, a news story, and we were in one of my stores, and it's a convenience store. We use a convenience store model, a C-store model, to bolster the uh, small margins in grocery stores, uh, uh, to bolster it economically. Uh, but we still put some choices of fruit and vegetables there. Yes, I have the bad stuff, and I'll grow and learn as everyone on the industry side will. Uh, but there was a little girl, unrehearsed, unprompted, who came to the counter with her mother, and there was a choice of candy, that impulse buy, apples, oranges, and bananas. And she looked, and she chose an apple. And I said, did you get that on camera? <laughs> <laughs> did you get that on camera? That's my only data right now. That's my only data right now. But giving people the choice and knowing that just a, a, a access to fresh food in a grocery store in so many rural and urban communities uh, is a, a need that is, is met. It changes what issues that we're dealing with when it comes to obesity. And it's also good business because it's pent up demand, economics 101. And I just want to also thank, after this small drop that I made into this issue, 
that I was asked to join the Alliance for a Healthier Generation, which is, uh, I'm a board member now, and I am so proud that we are impacting 23,000 schools and 13 million kids who are just like Hallie. And that we, we, also, we also understand that we may have differences, but the fact that we're in the same room, that Michael and Susan are here, that there can be some common ground, and we're proud to have been the organization that facilitate that common ground when we did the beverage and food agreements that Susan was talking about earlier. So the Alliance for a Healthier Generation I am proud to be a part of that organization, and thank you, Clinton Foundation, for starting it. Wendell, I just have to ask you very quickly. Um, I know that you don't have hard numbers, but I'm so curious as to, you know, what are you seeing? Are there any trends? In other words, are your fresh fruits and vegetables, are they going bad, or are you selling them? No, first of all, we are selling them. Right. And something else that we did was we, we started to say, how are we engaging the community? So on a monthly basis, we have those cooking lessons. There's a great chef here called Ya Pierce, who is a vegan chef, which I never thought I could eat vegan. <laughs> but she is wonderful. And we actually brought her to the store and she did cooking uh, lessons. The other thing, when it comes just to access, we knew that most of the people, especially in New Orleans, in the poor communities that we're going in, in the underserved communities, they only have maybe 27% with transportation. So we provide, if you get to the store and buy $50 worth of groceries, First come, first serve, we give you a free ride home with a Sterling shuttle. Oh, that's great. And that is important too. People is not only a great marketing tool, but it's actually something that facilitates people to make the choice to come to the store because they know they'll have access to the fresh food and also access to the transportation. To get there, to, to get there they know they'll have access home. So that's all important. So we are seeing a difference. Uh, years from now when my robust chain is growing all over the country, we'll have that empirical data for you, Joy. And it will be 100% good stuff. <laughs> uh, yes, in 100% Or at least 90-10. Yes, well, we'll be in those discussions with Michael and Susan to make sure that we, as an industry <laughs> member, uh, make those changes with uh, the process products that we have. Excellent, well, thank you. Thank you, because the education portion is relatively easy, and I think we're doing a great job with educating people but if it ain't there, they can't eat it. They can't follow through, so thank you. Hi, Janice. Hi, good morning. Good morning. Um, again, my name is Janice, and I'm with the Health Foundation of South Florida. We are a foundation that dedicates itself to improving the health status of residents in our geographic region. Since 2008, we have focused on healthy eating active communities, uh, priority area, and we do a lot of projects and investments that address the issue that we're talking about now. Um, I do want to point out that uh, when I talk, I'm going to talk about we as a community. There's a few folks in the audience that are from the South Florida region that have been doing a lot of the work um, with, in partnership with the foundation, and I hope that you get a chance to talk with them about some of the lessons learned and the great work that we have been doing. The other thing that I would like to mention is that oftentimes funders are thought of just funding programs and making investments, and we have played uh, various roles, numerous roles in the community when it comes to this work. One is a role of the convener, um, another is a role of a technical advisor, and we have also engaged in public policy where foundation staff in partnership with community partners go and visit decision makers to educate them about the work that's being done and about what needs to be done to improve the nutrition environments. Um, so in the next couple of minutes, um, I wanted to highlight some of the work that we have been doing in the region. Um, just to provide a bit of context, we were very fortunate in South Florida to receive a Communities Putting Prevention to Work grant that focused on obesity prevention, as well as a Community Transformation grant in Broward County that had some of the components um, that also address obesity prevention. So as a region, we've made a lot of progress, I would say, in improving the food environments, as well as other aspects that need to be addressed when it comes to childhood obesity. Um, one of the key successes um, that we're seeing right now, we talk a lot about improvements to nutrition guidelines that are impacting the school environment, but what happens in the early learning centers or what happens in the after school setting? Um, I think the, the field has been lagging a bit behind in terms of federal nutrition uh, guidelines for those settings. 
And in the region, we have actually partnered with early learning coalitions, the health planning councils, academia, to provide a training and technical um, assistance infrastructure to help child care center providers um, adopt better nutrition standards. We're working with caterers to improve the types of foods that are being offered, and we're also helping providers to make budget neutral menu changes. All this great work has actually led in one of the counties in Broward County to working with the county commission, finding a champion there for this type of work, and working with the child care licensing agency to take a look at revising the county ordinance that looks at licensing requirements for child care centers. And we're actually very excited that um, there's actually certain nutrition recommendations that they will be willing to adopt as part of licensing requirements. I think New York was one of the very first to be able to do this, and Broward County uh, sure seems to be moving in that direction. It's not everything that we would want it to be, but it's certainly a step in the right direction and it gets the conversation started. The other highlights um, in terms of the work that we've been doing to improve the food environment in our region fall under the community food access uh, realm, if you will. And um, we have a pretty exciting model uh, where youth are really the change agents and advocates. We're calling it the Healthy School Food Zone Initiative. Um, it's a really a youth-focused corner store initiative. Um, I think for political environments where tax and uh, banning fast food restaurants, et cetera. You know, we're not there yet um, when it comes to those type of strategies. What we did is what could we do in the short term? So we partnered with the YMCA. We identified food desert communities in the county. We identified schools where they had after school programs. And we have um, educated youth to learn how to identify food items in a corner store environment do photo voice, floor mapping assessments, and they have come up themselves with the recommendations of what they would like to see in those stores that are in close proximity to the schools. And let me tell you, they're very creative um, when it comes to product placement strategies, and hopefully this will lead to sort of more longer term change, whether that be environmental, working with, with distributors and vendors to try to get healthier items into these stores. But at the very least, we have youth that are changing their snack consumption behaviors. The other piece is we have started to venture out a bit and work with community development and economic development agencies. Uh, they're a great resource, um, as, uh, as has been said in earlier panels. Uh, we really have to leverage resources that are out there, and we sometimes forget that we have a lot of revenue coming in to support the revitalization of neighborhoods. And one partner that we have found to be very helpful um, are community redevelopment agencies. And they have been vital in terms of helping um, some of the community partners and the nonprofits identifying vacant land within blighted uh, communities that can be used for farmers markets, community gardens, or market gardens, which is a different model that leads to job creation. And so, um, you know, I think that we always have to think that's part of the innovative partnerships that we're trying to look at. Also working with the community loan fund, um, we have provided some uh, dollars to the food trust, which I'm sure you've probably heard about, to try to think about the healthy food financing strategy and what that would look like in our community, taking our, our own local context into place. So I look forward to a discussion um, because my time is up as well. <laughs> So encouraging. I wish we can heighten you like at that billion fold. <laughs> Will? Thanks, Joy. I'm Will Rosenzweig. I wanted to share the perspective of an entrepreneur. And as Risa said earlier, entrepreneurs aim beyond boundaries. They don't even see boundaries. They, they get a vision for what the future should look like, and they go out and make it happen. And they're, by nature, they're, um, they think big. They're, they're resourceful. Um, they're impatient. Uh, they don't take no for an answer. And uh, I had the good fortune of uh, starting in the world of healthy food and beverage back in my late 20s. And I was the founding CEO of a, a little tea company called the Republic of Tea. One of my favorites. And, thank you, Joy. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm getting a lot of tea fans here. Um, that company hit, hit a, a, a moment in the culture. And the aspiration was much more than to sell tea. It was really to sell the world's healthiest beverage. And and a way of living that we, we called sip by sip rather than gulp by gulp. And that company grew very quickly. Um, it was acquired by a bigger company. 
Then I was invited to join a company called Odwalla, which was innovating in the area of healthy, fresh juices, unprocessed juices, bringing the most nutritious products to market. That company grew really fast and was acquired by a really big company that's part of your constituency now. Then I thought, hmm, this is, this is interesting. I started to invest a little bit of the windfall that I, I, I gained, and I invested in a little yogurt company called Stonyfield Farms. And then 18 months later, it was acquired by Danone. And um, some of the friends and students at UC Berkeley said, how do you do that? Um, would you come teach that? So in 1998, I was invited to become the first professor of social entrepreneurship at UC Berkeley. And there I've had the benefit of just teaching amazing students. And two of them I wanted to mention to you today, you might have heard of them. Um, Kirsten Toby and Kristen Richmond have started a company called Revolution Foods. Well, eight years ago, they were in my class. That was before there was a first lady in a Let's Move campaign. That was before a lot of my acclaimed um, uh, panelists here were working full speed ahead. These two ladies had no background in food, but they decided that they wanted to, to reinvent the healthy food uh, for, for school lunches. And they started in one school in Oakland. Uh, on the day they graduated, they attracted venture capital from a community development venture capital firm, which was really looking about developing uh, new businesses and services in, in underserved areas. They started with one school. Now I can say eight years later, they're serving over a million meals a week in seven states. They've attracted more capital than probably most foundations could ever cobble together, private capital. The design, what I've learned most is that these kinds of um, entrepreneurial endeavors can be designed. And at the heart of this, we designed the business to hold really um, important sort of unshakable core values. And one of the core values is access. And Revolution Foods, 80% of the meals that they serve of that million meals a week reach underserved children. This is a for-profit business. In the investor base, we have mainstream venture capital, community development venture capital, foundations, individuals, philanthropists. We have the most interesting combination of people who are all working for the same objective, which is really to bring healthy school lunches um, to market. So I've, I've been fascinated with what happens when you bring people from different disciplines together to create change and get to scale. Because in this model, scale equals impact. And the growth that entrepreneurs can aspire to and fuel and, 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 and bring is, um, is just transformative. So this has now led me, the, the, the most recent thing I'm involved in with, with some of the people here today um, is called the Vitality Commission on Health Promotion and the Prevention of Chronic Diseases Among Working-Aged Americans. So we're very happy to be partnering with the Clinton Foundation and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and a number of uh, large corporations like Microsoft, Qualcomm, Humana. Um, we're working with the leading uh, schools of public health in the country, Columbia and Johns Hopkins. And we're really working on uh, a cross-disciplinary collaboration to figure out, to bring this kind of entrepreneurial systems change into this uh, realm. And we're, we're actually focusing now on working age Americans because we think children, we've, we've got the ball rolling now and it's good, we're making progress. But it's really key that their parents are getting the attention and the places where they're working are paying attention to this. So um, on June 18th, we're gonna be coming out with a report and recommendation that are gonna very much build on the themes of the culture of health that Robert Wood Johnson Foundation has introduced. And if you go to the vitalityinstitute.org, you can learn more about what we're doing. That's terrific. Thank you. And when you're done with that endeavor, we want to move you over to the food accessibility for children. Deal? <laughs> so we have a question from Facebook. How do we effectively incorporate children to become major players in providing access to healthy foods and beverages? Who wants to take a stab at that? I'll start. Well, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, Go ahead. All right. I'll be quick so you can jump in. Uh, I, I think, f first of all, by doing what we're doing and teaching them that there are better ways to eat. Okay, so that's step one. So, so giving them that uh, platform. And then, you know, kids really want to be engaged. 
And so if we can, whether it's in Washington, D.C., or the county or the city, really engage the kids in the process, they really, it's a twofold thing. Number one, they can see that they can make change. And number two, um, they can actually get involved in local government. So I think to answer the question, how do we effectively incorporate, engage them. Just get them involved. Ask them the question. You know, we have Kiana who comes uh, on hill visits with us, and they, they just love to do that kind of stuff. So you have, you have to, A, teach them that it's the right thing to do, and B, let them know that there's a way to actually make change. I 100% agree. And also, um, you know, sort of pressing the rewind button, when I was in the school in East Harlem, we had a nutrition committee. And I think if all the schools put these health committees and let the kids own it into place, we can get them involved in public policy. We can give them a voice. I think you know it's a learning curve for them on so many levels, but they could help us get the job done. You know, at, Rev Food, at Revolution Foods, um, the, one of the secrets of their success is that kids eat the food. They eat the healthy food. That's very, very important. It's not as simple as it sounds, especially when their palates have been developed in a, in a different way. And the kids in New Orleans have a different taste profile than they do in Newark. Um, so the kids are intimately involved in the design of the recipes. And they actually hold these Iron Chef competitions, and they bring the kids from the schools into the culinary center. They teach them how to use the knives and prepare the food. And so the recipes are really kid-inspired and sort of chef-developed. We, we found in uh, Sterling Farms that in the cooking demonstrations to participate, uh, we, we ask that the kids participate. So they actually learn something about cooking the food and also go into the store, pick up the produce, and come back and learn how to right. cook this. No, the so to make that connection. The interest is there, absolutely. It's about having the accessibility of right. these healthy foods, and then the like your market. And then the Alliance School program, is, uh, we found that the program was working in the school, but at the same time, we needed to have a program outside the school. So we started to develop the uh, uh, programs outside of the school also, where the kids then take the knowledge that they've attained at school to then challenge their parents. So it makes that connection that Will was talking about. Uh, just very briefly, um, I would think that we need to think about ways in which we can include hands-on experiential learning, you know, school gardens being integrated into the nutrition curriculum in schools has been a great way in which children um, have been, since very early on, been engaged in the nutrition-related uh, messaging. And, you know, it's almost like what they grow, they eat, you know, I think there's a misconception that children won't eat the broccoli or won't eat the kale or the okra. Um, and I think that's one way in which we can engage them. And obviously the, the example that I provided earlier of partnering with uh, youth serving organizations, the Boys and Girls Club, YMCAs, et cetera, um, and getting them not only the message and educating them on why this is important, but you know we have a model that's been very successful in tobacco using the SWAT teams, and I think there's no reason to think that youth cannot be engaged in also becoming advocates for changing the food environment. So I think the engagement piece, the education piece, and, and finding ways in which they can engage in projects, whether it's you know changing the corner stores, the marketing strategies, and making them part of that process um, will help. There's a program in, in uh, Oakland run by the University of California at San Francisco called The Bigger Picture. And they have, it's teenagers who get involved and make wonderful videos with a nutrition health message. Mm -hmm. And they're really um, some tough videos, interesting. I would just add, uh, from the perspective of, of, of a, as a mother, with an end of one with my uh, junior in high school, hopefully my behavior has some influence on her and how I put things together as a mother is influential. But she had a health education class in school when she was in eighth grade, such a key time for kids when they're very concerned about their body image. And, and she is so well disciplined in the way that she thinks about consuming calories and how it all gets balanced with exercise. So again, it's an end of one, but I'm struck by how profound an impact that had on her as she's having her big bowl of strawberries as a snack as opposed to something else, um, and how she's balancing her exercise and consumption of calories. Uh, I do think education in the schools, which the Alliance and so many others are on top of, is absolutely critical. No, absolutely, and, but she had the strawberries, right? So she has the education and the strawberries, and like this is our whole conundrum. So is there a question from the audience? Sure. Um, so, 
Hi, my name is Eduardo Sanchez. I'm with the American Heart Association. I had the honor and privilege of being a part of Way to the Nation. I don't have a question, just another ad. Um, if you haven't seen the great cafeteria takeover, um, Google it, see it. It is about empowerment. Um, and beyond just learning about food, um, it's about learning how to change policy in the school setting by a group of youth, I think, in New Orleans. Uh, a fabulous, fabulous documentary. Thank you so much. Hello, hi panelists. Uh, my name's Reed, and my question is really about the best angle that all of the different levels of the community can come together to convince schools that food, fitness education has as much a place in the curriculum as English or science or math, and is just as important and valid to be teaching today's youth. Well, we've seen this really ground up. I mean, to your, your, uh, your example of the, the cafeteria takeover, it starts with it starts with students and it starts with their parents and um, asking for something better and being empowered and, and, and getting together. And so uh, finding our, our happy Haley's and finding people that can advocate is just so critical. I've never seen um, a, a principal react more strongly when uh, the, you know, the effort is organized from within. Uh, to adopt and try and experiment you know, with something new. And there's enough examples now um, that can be replicated and applied. And so we have, to, we have to get those best practices out. Right, and, no, and I agree, and I do think that we're gaining solid momentum within the school system, thanks to people up here and so many orga organizations around the country. Um, we do have an imbalance, though, in terms of education and the food that's available. So, you know, hopefully, we're going to catch up on the availability side. Do you, go, do you all agree with that? Yes. Uh, Speaking of food deserts and these right. low-income areas. Well, you know, um, I've, I've made a choice as, you know, as a for-profit business to go into there. Um, I think the policymakers have made it, uh, have incentivized, you know, businesses to go in with like the HFFI, which I'm just such a big fan of. I also think that something as um, uh, was mentioned earlier about SNAP, uh, on the good side, I, I think this is just a state program in Michigan where it's two for one for produce and uh, for f fruit and vegetables. You get, uh, you get a two for one with your SNAP dollar. That should be implemented across the country. Yes. And I think it's a part of it. I think it's something, a part of the uh, agenda. Um, but also specifically to the question that Reed posed in New Orleans, uh, specifically we are at maybe like 80% charter schools. And a part of the policy that has been changed, that has been changed, is for you to get your charter, you have to meet a certain level of nutritional guidelines in the schools, and that's where Revolution Foods has come in. And Revolution Foods actually has a, 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 a main, um, uh, I guess, warehouse and kitchen in New Orleans to service most of the schools in the, in the charter system that we have. So th that's where policy is actually you know, being implemented, where for you to get a school charter, you have to meet a certain level of nutritional guidelines that have been set. And if you don't, you don't get the charter. Speaking from the manufacturing side, uh, certainly from a beverage standpoint, the market is going that way, and that's what we're producing. 45% of the non-alcoholic beverage industry that I represent, our port 45% of our portfolio is zero calorie beverages right now. And that is just continuing to grow as we innovate more, uh, identify new and different sweeteners and technologies, there are gonna be more choices out there. But I do think, I guess that was the point of the story about my daughter, you need the pull. There's a lot of options out there. There's lots of ways to moderate your beverage calories or your food calories. But you have to have the knowledge that that's an important thing to do and um, select those options. We, we also have to be data driven. Um, I, I think somebody said earlier today where uh, kids who are healthy and happy, eating better, they come to school, they're, they're fed, productive. they're productive. And so we have to show those stats. And you show those stats, then you can go to those policymakers and say, look, here's the deal. If kids are healthy and happy, they're gonna do better in school. So we have to do that. Hi, I'm Greg from the Clinton Foundation. I would like to know what steps are being taken to address 
um, really the, the culture of overconsumption in America in regards to portion control, um, especially among lower socioeconomic communities who are looking um, at you know food that is not the best for you. You get two for one, and you know food that is available, but it's not necessarily the best for you. And also, um, really developing our relationship with food in the long term in terms of chronic health diseases and obesity, which seem to really be becoming a problem. How we look at food, how we interact with food, and how our families address food on a, on a larger scale. I mean, well, I can address it from the communication standpoint. This is what I'm out there trying to, you know, portray to people that portion size, portion size is almost more important than the actual food choices. This is what got us into trouble in the first place. I think another fabulous thing are people like Reed. So Reed, he, he has a direct relationship with kids, teenagers, and young adults. And we, have, we need more people like Haley and like Reed who are relatable, and they're out there as well, really educating, connecting, and um, doing great things in the health community. I can't talk to the, the corporation side, but I'm sure a lot of you guys can. Well, I, I, your question is enormous. Yeah. You know, we could be here all day talking about different aspects of it. Um, portion control is a tough issue because there seems to be competition in the restaurant world to give you the most food for your dollar or two dollars. And I think McDonald's is uh, offering any size drink for a dollar. So you get a 30 ounce soda for, for a buck. And, um, and I'm not sure how you, f how you fight that. You see 79 cent two liter bottles of soda and you see, you know, uh, double cheeseburgers and triple cheeseburgers and, you know, pizzas that are stuffed to the rim with cheese and sausage and everything Crazy. else. Yeah, so menu labeling, getting calories on labels, on menus, which will happen soon. Right, Sam? Yes. Yes, he says. <laughs> Sam been, said that here. He's been saying that for three years. Oh. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, <laughs> The regs are at OMB. We, we, the regs are at OMB, right, Sam? Any day now. <laughs> yeah. we're, we're making progress. We're, yeah. And, uh, it's, but it's, um, you know, I don't, have a, I don't have an answer on the portion size. Susan can brag about the seven and a half ounce sodas that it gives people a choice to have a smaller one so they're not automatically stuck with a 12 ounce one. But, uh, you know, I think. Uh, People have, there's a, there has to be a lot of individual responsibility. People are going to have to learn. Stop eating when you're full. Don't finish it just because it's on your plate. Right, so I, I actually would build on that, Michael, and build on what I said before. We're making a lot more choices that have fewer calories, whether it's in the, the container size or just the, the beverage itself has zero or fewer calories. We're also, that's the point of the calorie labels, which we put on the front of every canned bottle and pack. We put on vending machines and are continuing with that implementation. So when you go to hit that button, you can see how many calories are in that selection. So it is a combination of choices and information. But again, you have to create this awareness that I need to balance my calories. And you know, those two liter bottles for 79.99 cents could be zero calorie sodas. So have one of those if you need to moderate your calories. So that's how industry thinks about it. We're trying to make more options that people want. We're trying to give people information so they know what they're choosing. And we've also added on our vending machines a little nudge, as uh, it's called, uh, calories count, check, then choose. So you think even more about the calories as before you hit that uh, vending selection button. So that's how we come at this choice information support what we could do, what can we do to help the consumer balance all this for him or herself as michael just said generally speaking what is the price point difference between the small sodas like the new t really small mini ones versus the standard well if you think of that the standard is 12 ounce they're about the same price as that and i can go into the mechanics of that they're actually are harder to make those small um, portion sizes. So they're roughly the same as a 12 ounce. So, so 
you find that people are buying the small ounce, or are they looking at it and doing a price comparison and saying, I hey, think I want the, more? Uh, um, you know, I always say that the, uh, the members uh, in my organization are a testament to how the free market works. There's a, uh, we call it sort of the war of the minis, and you'll see the beverage manufacturer sort of with competitive advertising pushing people to look at those minis. So I guess that's a signal to all of us as consumers that they are popular, they're working, because when you get these ferocious competitors all marketing them, that, that says people like them. And uh, you see displays on the end of aisles in grocery stores, again, featuring the minis. So those are the kind of things that people that are smart in marketing do to create a demand for that size portion. So this is a question from Twitter. What research is out there that looks at the impact of taxes on behavior change? I'm looking at you. <laughs> uh, well, there's a, there's a lot of research, um, most obviously from tobacco and it's basic economics. You raise the price, consumption falls. Mexico, um, around the first of the year, adopted a peso um, per liter tax on soda. Consumption fell overnight by 5%. It's an absolutely certain way to reduce consumption to a point. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not gonna solve any, you know, I, I suggested a penny an ounce tax that would cut con, uh, consumption by about 10%, which is, you know, it's a good chunk. It's not the whole ball game. And um, I think Americans, even without the tax, Americans have been doing well. We're actually consuming 25% less sh sugared carbonated drinks now than we did 15 years ago, 25% per capita. It's a huge change, you know, it reflects, um, um, I think a sea change in the public's thinking about soda and an incentive for the companies to come up with these alternative products, uh, smaller cans or uh, new sweetener types. Um, we, we need more of your help. I think in Britain, Coca-Cola does not advertise full sugar sodas, only diet sodas. Wouldn't it be nice to get Beyonce here to throw away the Pepsis and only advertise diet Pepsis? <laughs> Well, I can say uh, there's a lot there, so it's always hard to know exactly what to respond to, Michael. But I, I, so I'll take your, I'll take your last point first. I would say that the uh, major beverage companies have had a policy that they followed for many years that they do not uh, advertise any of their products to children under 12. Not internet, not uh, television, not. Uh, any kind of social media engagement. So uh, we are united in that score as it relates to our young children. Um, I, th there is research out there that says if you tax the product, I think you have to get to about a 75% tax on a can of soda, that that will start to change behavior a little, but not enough so that it will impact um, BMI in any significant way. So. If you want to raise revenue, you tax anything. I mean, you tax a soft drink, you tax uh, our cars, you tax uh, our homes. I mean, taxes produce revenue. So that's, that's certainly true. Now, whether it's a fair tax, an equitable tax, one that should be done, um, that's another question. And I can tell you, over and over, the public does not think that is the way to go. So I would submit, Michael, that we waste a lot of energy in these tax battles trying to impose something that is economists will tell you is not going to change behavior in any significant way that the public doesn't want and just waste a lot of energy and resources better again bring us into the tent bring us to the table and let's engage around things that will make a difference i was just going to go back to the question so that our our twitter listener can maybe look up dr kevin volp at uh at penn at the wharton school it's probably doing the leading work in health economics behavioral economics with respect to incentives and um, taxes and, and the like. Kevin Volpe. Th okay, thank you. Thank you for that. I always think it would be cool to tax just a little bit the majority of the junk food within certain areas and then use the money that was collected to then subsidize all of the whole grains and the fruits and vegetables right back into that very same area. I know that there would be a lot of backlash, but I think we'd do a lot of good. Um, can we take an audience question? Susan, hi, my name's Glenn Schneider. I'm from the Horizon Foundation in Maryland. 
And I'm glad you're here and I've been enjoying this debate here back and forth. Um, last summer, our community decided that we wanted to be much like you are in talking about choice. And we went out and sent street teams out to talk about the 300 beverages that your manufacturers make that are very healthy. And what we found is that no one had any idea about them. And when we dug a little bit deeper, we found that the Rudd Center says uh, that even your largest manufacturer that you're working with, Coca-Cola, spends about $300 million, uh, or three quarters of its advertising budget, uh, pushing the sugary stuff. Uh, and, and is there some way, when we went and we asked our local ABA person, can we partner together to have you advertise the healthier stuff in our community, we've received no response at all. Is there a way to switch that around so that in our community, you're advertising the healthier things rather than the sugary stuff linked to diabetes and weight gain and all the rest? Well, I, I, I do contest the figures with the Rudd Center. I don't think those are, are accurate, uh, knowing something about the mix in the um, uh, where the companies spend their dollars. I think it's uh, uh, those are out of proportion. But I do think that there's great interest on the part of the companies in creating more demand for the products that we're innovating and creating. And uh, we are actively talking about ways to create more pull for those products. Um, the companies are individually, and we're talking uh, collectively about how to create more desire for um, the choices that allow you to balance your beverage calories. So the answer is yes, we can talk. Great question. Hi, my name is Barbara Tulipane. I'm with the National Recreation and Park Association. Appreciate all the information um, that you were sharing with us today. I have um, a question, it's actually for Wendell. I, about two months ago, NPR did a story on, okay, we talked about the food deserts, and now we've had some time in some communities to, to solve for that. And I think the, the thought was, if they build it, they will come. This report stated that that is not the case, that people aren't coming. And I wanted to learn from you, why is it working in your area, and apparently it's not in others? Uh, well, that's a good report because uh, it's not always working in my area. Uh, I'm actually transferring a store to another area as we speak, um, getting into business. Uh, as an actor, I'm a silo, one employee, one company, as I started the grocery store business, I realized that uh, it's like holding the tiger by the tail. Um, uh, uh, it, is, it is changing culture, changing behavior. As the question was posed earlier, uh, how do we get people to change? Uh, it, it's, it's going to take time, and then also, how do you engage the community? One of the things that we find that works best is giving that ride home. That has been something that has really attracted people uh, to our store. Um, uh, also, the other thing is that cooking class and actually engaging the community once a month to, to see, uh, to, to in inspire their creativity when it comes to uh, using the food. Also, very, very interesting, I'm from New Orleans, so you know all the culinary issues we have. Um, <laughs> uh, also, challenging people to uh, have the two coexist, you know? to say, uh, I, I remember there's a movement and a cultural change that's trying to take hold in New Orleans of saying, we don't have to give up gumbo, let's try to make a healthy gumbo. You know, we don't have to give up jambalaya, let's try to make a healthy jambalaya. And so uh, that culturally is something that's gonna happen. Uh, in particular, when it comes to food deserts, I don't think people are going in. The incentive still hasn't incentivized my colleagues in the industry to come into those communities. We still are sitting on the sidelines. There was a perfect example in Los Angeles years ago that I'm trying to build my business um, to replicate what Will is doing uh, and has done, uh, uh, where the two can coexist, and that was Boy's Grocery Store, where they went into underserved Latino communities um, where other grocers weren't going. He built a wonderful business, and he was bought by a larger chain. So we know that it can work. Uh, we know that it works, uh, and the demand is there, especially in rural areas, which is what we're starting to discover now in one of the first areas we're going into in Alexandria, Louisiana. The third ward has never had any food retail outside of one corner store. One corner store for about 
20,000 people, you know? Uh, and so you're dealing with all kinds of uh, opportunity there and demand. And, and I say once again to the business community, you, we cannot look at China and India and see that as emerging markets and not look at these rural communities and urban settings and not see the same opportunity there. And what's going to happen is once Sterling Farms Grocery becomes the successful chain that it will be one day, everyone will first want to buy it at 8% EBITDA. Uh, <laughs> and then it's going to be replicated. So uh, it does work. It does work. And I saw earlier, I saw earlier a question uh, from live, live stream saying, is, is there advocacy on a grassroots level? There's one I want to point out in New Orleans, Sankofa, which is in the Lower Ninth Ward, where we did an open air grocery store with them. There's also, supported by Robert Woods uh, Foundation, I was going to forget it, Fresh Moves in Chicago, where they take uh, RT buses, you know, and they transform them into mobile produce stores and take them, literally drive commerce and fresh food into food deserts. We have the examples of best practices. We just need to replicate them. And Wendell, I, just, I, I, I was just gonna, Wendell, you asked before, are you making a difference? You're making a difference. You just have to remember it takes 15 years to become an overnight success. <laughs> Stick with it. So true. Uh, I will. <laughs> um, and to, to piggyback on that, I'm gonna tell you to take advantage of nutrition students. There are universities all over the country with lots of undergrad and graduate registered dietitian students, and they are just itching to jump in and do all sorts of creative volunteer work. So you don't even have to think about what you want them to do. You just need to recruit them and say, this is, you know, we want more people coming and buying the healthy stuff. What do you want to be doing? They will do programs, they will do one-on-ones, they will create all sorts of hoopla within your location. You, they will blow your mind. We heard earlier that uh, two of the six strategies that work well in combating childhood obesity is healthier school meals and advertising. And there is a large gap that exists between what is out there as far as standards in advertising versus the standards in the schools. And um, we had the fortune, I, I work for a large food, food manufacturing um, organization and I am a registered dietitian. And we had the fortune of having a dietitian intern come and look at all of our products and compare them to the wide variety of standards that are out there. And it, it's scientific, scientifically impossible to create a product that meets all of these different criteria. They're all great in their individuality, but what CFBAI and what Disney and what Nickelodeon and what the schools have as criteria, you can't create an item. So I would ask for leadership in harmonizing the standards, which would allow the brilliant people that are in food and beverage manufacturing organizations use the technology that exists and is emerging to accelerate the creation of new products that children can have at school, they can ride their bike or walk home from school and watch that educational program and see advertising about that healthy product, that mom can buy that product in the grocery store, and that special treat when they go out, they can have that item in a, in a restaurant. But right now, we've got all different criteria and different products in different models. You have to remember, can I just butt in? Um, I, I think that's a very important point. Wouldn't it be wonderful to have some federal nutrition guidelines for marketing to kids? And your brilliant food technologist and nutritionist can figure out what foods meet those guidelines. Unfortunately, uh, the brilliant lobbyists at the Grocery Manufacturers Association killed those federal guidelines, killed them. And in fact, the lobbyist, I think Scott Faber for the grocery manufacturers said killing those guidelines is our industry's number one priority. That was about three years ago. So that's the status, they're dead. <laughs> On that happy note. <laughs> so I actually
actually have to wrap this up, and we need to smile. So let me quickly <laughs> ask each of you, if I showed up at your house and I opened your refrigerator, what one food will I always find, Michael? Fat-free yogurt. Fat-free yogurt. Regular or Greek, flavored or plain? Uh, the big container of regular and the small ones of Greek. Perfect. Kevin? Wouldn't be in the refrigerator because they go dark, but I have an issue with bananas. I love bananas. Well, that's a good issue. I'll, I'll eat them all day. <laughs> Excellent. Potassium packed. Susan? Well, other than all my favorite beverages, which is many, right? <laughs> <laughs> she needs a raise. <laughs> You'd always find hummus there, because I have quite an addiction to it, as do my children. So there's the secret. <laughs> Excellent. Wendell? Uh, oranges. Uh, I love tangerines, actually, <laughs> when they're in season. But uh, And living in California. Uh, growing up in New Orleans, I don't know why. We didn't get the best oranges. But man, living in California, ah, oh, it's the best. <laughs> Such a show off. <laughs> Janice? Um, I would say low-fat milk. We're big drinkers of milk. <laughs> nice. Well, tea, of course. <laughs> Obviously. In the fridge? Oh, iced tea, the iced tea. Okay, excellent. And I would say for me, um, it would be non-fat Greek yogurt, plain, because I like the tangy taste of sour cream, and definitely hot sauce. I'm a spicy chick, complete connoisseur, all different brands lined up. So I, I want to thank everybody for coming, for, for, for participating. I think we had great questions, a lot of hard questions. And this is a really important conversation, not just for today, but I think that we need to have ongoing so that we can brainstorm, we can strategize, and we can execute on some real solutions. Thank you. Now for lunch. <laughs>